Thank you, John, for the prayer board of encouragement and the need for encouragement. And then the last song that God is pursuing us. And we have been in this study of Genesis and it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me and we hardly have gotten started how God does pursue us and makes way for us and opportunity for us. And you encourage me when I stand back there and I look and I look at those that have got up and got dressed and reported for duty as we have said and talked about before, it's just a wonderful encouragement. It's a, it's a quite nice morning out if you haven't noticed and there's a lot of other places you could be and the fish were jumping on the lake and but you chose to come here to see what the Lord would have for you to hear. And then there are those that aren't able to be with us that are joining us at home, and we welcome them too and are grateful that we have the means and the ability to be able to do that. And so, thank you. I want to share again, I have this in the back. You're welcome to take it. It's just as we kind of walk through the scriptures, do with it what you wish. It's a just a 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, and you can fill in the blanks, kind of a fun thing. And then the table talk sheets that I put out, they're in the new ones are in the back also. They're just to help you to be able to sit around the table if we do that and be able to raise some questions, add to them. They're just starters by no means all-inclusive at all. So we continue our journey. You know, I grew up just east of town here. And as a little boy, I was quite naive. I didn't get out much. Going to even Muskegon was a big deal, and Grand Rapids was like an all-day event. And I learned as I got older, and not that I've totally got the full message, but that I was, quite, I was quite ignorant, quite naive as to the world and what goes on, and just exposure. I had no culture exposure, no different ethnic or background exposure whatsoever. And... Uh, for some reason, and I don't know why, but I spoke with someone last week and they said the same thing and it just kind of cracked me up. For some reason, I had this mindset then as I got older, when I ran across a situation where someone spoke a different language, I had this, I had this belief that if I just slowed down and said simple words and really loud, they'd understand me. Uh, my daughters didn't care for that much. One time we were with Caitlin, Beth and I at Ikea, and I don't know where we were. And I needed the restroom really bad, and I come up to a gentleman employee, and all of a sudden I caught on. I said, dude, you know, please can you tell me where the restroom is? It's a big store. And he, you know, went like this. I, oh, man, we got a problem. So really loud and really clear, I said, Bathroom. Caitlin about, just like, really, where'd you come from? What rock did they let you out of? Well, you know, there's some things in life we don't need words for. We can communicate to each other. A tear. Or a smile. It's universal. Well, I learned that day that the word bathroom, or at least the look of it, is universal also, because he pointed me over to the right direction. Well, this morning, as we continue on, we've gotten to the Tower of Babel. And we're going to find, oh, yeah, I wanted to show you. So I, I need to share this. Let's see if we're good. So if you see me, if I come up to you and we're talking, and I say one syllable word really loud, it's because I'm not understanding, okay? So be patient with me. This, this morning, we're going to run across some language barriers and the belief of why we have the different languages in our world today when we speak of the Tower of Babel. But I titled the talk this morning, as you know, I, I, I've shared before that I often look for, Lord, give me the gold nugget, whatever that is, that we can like, just focus on something. And as I look back at our, at our history of what we've been studying in Genesis, and we're up to chapter 11 now, but since the fall, we see where there becomes division. There comes division and a separation between us and God, almost like there's sides. And then between Satan and us and God. 
And then between Cain and Abel, there was division. And then the world got so bad and, and with the flood that God took away and he, he, he saved Noah, but there was a division of the people. And then we're back and then we go through the story of Nimrod. Well, actually with the, the getting to the Tower of Babel, but chapter 10 that we talked about this Nimrod and this son, this great-grandson, and how he was just, uh, uh, he was against God and how he started setting up the city and, and, and it's where we're headed. And like there's these sides that we're dealing with. And so the message that I had on my heart is not there. Pick your side. Doesn't seem to be working real well. Pick your side. It's a reasonable question that one would ask, where did all the different languages come from? How did they develop? And our scripture this morning is, is credited to why we have the divergent speech. Chapter 11 that we're going to is the last pre-Jewish story. Theologians have split Genesis into two parts, chapters 1 through 11 and then 12 through 50. And when we get into the 12 through 50, where we're headed, we'll, we'll look at the patriarchs, our forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But 1 through 11 is a setup that tells us about God pursuing us and his love for us, even in our shortcomings and in our unreasonableness. We looked at Noah's three sons and the property and the land that they took. And that Mount Ararat where the, where the ark landed was up in Turkey, up in the, up in the north there. And we're going to see as we head over, Baghdad, Iraq is where Babylon is. It's right where, it's right where we believe that the Garden of Eden is somewhere in that area, in Mesopotamia, in the Tigris and Euphrates River, right in there in that area. And that's where they're going to head that we're going to see. We learned about how all of man's existence comes from these three sons, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and how God had divided them up. It's a bookend. Chapter 11 is a bookend to chapter 3. It's a zoom in on the first half of chapter 10. We learned about the family tree and all of humanity came from one of these three boys. Hmm. Pick your side. Genesis 11. Let's start with verse 1. Let's pray a minute. Father, thank you for the script. All of our days are dependent upon you. They are numbered according to your will. Lord, we awake each day and get to choose on which side that we're going to live out this life which you have given us. If we're going to live it out in your kingdom or if we're going to live it out in the world's kingdom. If we're going to follow Jesus and his commands or if we're going to follow the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Dear Jesus, this morning we have all come together because we want to choose you. We want to follow you we want to be committed to you and how you would have us to live and how you would have us to walk and how you would have us to act and how you would have us to share and invest in others and do these things that John and everybody else put on the board of being able to encourage each other and support each other and come alongside each other because life can be tough. And you have told us that. I'm so grateful that we have this chance together. Blessed be your name. Holy are you, O Lord. Amen, amen. Genesis chapter 1. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words 
And we're going to step it up. It's the same reference that was used in chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. When he was talking about the flood, and he said the whole earth, the whole earth, it's like everybody, all that there is, all that he created, all that there was, all the land and everything, it's the same language. They were talking the same language. It was a universal religion to this point. He had made a covenant with all the people, the rainbow, all the people. I will not take you out again by flood. I will love you. It's a new beginning. Chapter 11 comes with a lot of firsts. We talked about Genesis, meaning beginnings. It's the first city, chapter 11, the first kingdom. It's the first use of brick and tar. It's the first creation of multiple languages. It's a lot of firsts. And we come to verse 2, and it says, And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They journeyed east. Now, we know a couple things. We know that Noah lived 350 years after the flood. And I didn't trace it back to find out when did the kids move? When did they pack up with their wives and their kids? And when did they head out? If we look at at one of the boys' um, heritages, we know that he had a kid two years after the flood. So we kind of get an indication there. But I didn't didn't play it out to see, because I'm thinking, like, how long before they came to... The, the, new, the new land, this tower of Babel, this, uh, this town of Babel, which becomes Babylon. And so I, we didn't have that played out. But, so they head out, and they headed east. I said last week about east, and that uh, it, it, when I looked it up and had done some study on it, that east was kind of associated with evil, bad, and that west was associated with good. And when we were having, I was having lunch with Lindsay over at the Palmertons, and, and we got talking about that, and he said, you know, East always bad? Is that always in the script? And it raised a question because of like the Star of David's in the East and some things like that. Got me wondering. I went back and looked because, well, I'll mention another Yogi, not Yogi Bear, who I did last week. This is Yogi Berra, who was a catcher for the, the Yankees, the great catcher. He said, well, you know, most things I've said, I haven't said. What that means is what I say is probably comes from someone else. So I thought, well, i got to go back and check my resources because I use a lot of resources and a lot of commentaries and a lot of script and a lot of books and a lot of people, and I try to be, use good ones. And most of the time, if I want to verify something, I want at least two verifications of it. And I thought I had, but I wasn't sure. Well, I found this statement with a gentleman by the name of Stephen Armstrong. He's gone now. Uh, but he's a great guy, he did a great work for the Lord, verse by verse ministries, and he made the statement. And he says, it seems that there's this thought process and whatnot that the East is bad. And really what it indicated that God in the scriptures gave it some kind of, you know, we know that, that Adam and Eve came out of, they went East when they were kicked out of the garden. We know that Cain had had East after he killed Abel. We know that these people, the, boy, the sons had it East. When they, when they left the ark, we know that uh, the Decapolis, when you get into the New Testament, uh, you get across, that's east, that's bad. You go across the Sea of Galilee, that's not a fun place. The evil happens over there. So east did have this connotation in the script. When I back up from that and come at it from 10,000 feet, it was just like it kind of hit me, as God always does, his faithfulness and the incredibleness of how he says, okay, this is evil. I have overcome evil. The swords to the garden were on the east. The temple, the east gate, that's what Christ is going to come through. The star of David is in the east. God says, I've overcome evil. All these things, people, any superstitions, any stuff that you might have, thinking about, you know, we're relating to this, the east and west and north and south, and I mean, my goodness, He's saying, I've overcome it. I'm control of all things. I am God. So they come out of the east. They headed to Shinar. What, I, uh, what I've said about that and thought about that is, is uh, just consider this. You know, It's like, well, they're heading home. They want to go home. I've said a few times, we long to go back to the garden. Don't we? We long to go to the garden. I long to go to the garden. I long to have that peace. I long to have that relationship with God. I long to have that relationship with people and where there's just none of those issues. So they headed back east. Then verse 3, they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. 
And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. Okay, this is an interesting part because you, you, you look at it and say, well, then they said to one another, they're kind of getting together and they're talking, let us make bricks. Bricks were a big deal. Everything before was probably built with stone. That's what you had. That's what was there. To figure out how you can take the clay and you can burn it and heat it and make it strong and use bricks and the mortar. I mean, I, I, you've had basements in Michigan, basements where they use stone and they put in the mortar around and now it's falling all down on your floor. Mortar wasn't that great. This pitch that they used, this tar that they used, was pretty tough stuff. And the bricks are pretty tough stuff. I mean, they're doing a lot of excavating in, in Israel and a lot of other places where they still are finding these, these structures of brick. And, you know, I went by First Baptist Church and they're using brick today. They're putting it on their new entrance. Like, we like brick. This was a big deal. These weren't dumb people. They said, come let us build for ourselves a city a tower whose top will reach into the heavens and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They said, come let us <laughs> build for ourselves a city. We think of chapter 11, the story's Tower of Babel. There's a big point here also. The city is involved in this. And a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. Now, do you really think they thought they could reach the heavens? Let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Well, I've kind of emphasized my point, as you can see throughout it. Build for ourselves. My wife's getting tired of moving, for those that you know us. She'd like to settle down. These people were vagabonds. I didn't measure the distance from Mount Ararat to Babylon. It's quite a ways. They've been on the move for a while. They've been living in tents for a while. They've been packing up and storing up and cooking and for a while. They were ready to settle down. And here we see where humanity, at least the first account, tries to build the first mega city, complete with a high-rise tower in the center. <laughs> we would Chicago. I love Chicago as a city to visit. It's a working city. It's wonderful. We took this boat tour down the river. And they tell you about all these buildings, and they're massive, impressive buildings. I mean, it was quite something. You can't hardly sit there and say, wow, without saying, wow, man did this? Wow, this is pretty impressive. And I thought you just got an architect and started laying block, but no, 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 no. They have, they have big stories behind all these buildings and what motivated them and inspired them and what it's after, And right? I mean, it's complicated stuff. Man's capable of quite a bit. God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Not to stay in a city. He didn't say, okay, boys, multiply, gather all together, and hang out. We like being together. Eric mentioned that this morning when we were praying. We like being together. I hope you like coming here being together. Years ago when I was in the auto business and Internet was kind of taken off, and uh, I don't know, there was various avenues where you could buy cards online, and I think, I don't know if it was Walmart or who was selling cards, I forget what it was, and they were all, all just like dealers, were, oh, this is going to be the end of us, they're not going to need us anymore, and my heart said, no, no. People like being together too much. They like going and touching and feeling and smelling and talking and negotiating, and we like it on some level. God didn't tell us to stay in the cities and build cities. Dennis Prager, my Jewish theologian that I listen to, 
He says there's massive moral disadvantages in the city. He says, take a drive in the country. He's from L.A., by the way. He says, you see a farmer working with his family and you wave. And if his family's with him and they see you, they all wave back. He said, try that downtown L.A. We also have the first expression here of humanism, secular humanism. If you go back to verse 4, they said, let us, for ourselves, let us, for ourselves, make a name for ourselves. Let us. Come see what we've built, what we have done. Aren't we great? Isn't it grand? Isn't it awesome? Isn't my life fantastic? Lucky me. Wouldn't you like to be me? He says, if we work together, we can do this. We can be important. We can have status and importance amongst each other. We can become self-sufficient, only needing ourselves, not needing God. We don't need God. We don't need the world. We can have it all right here. We will be too big to fail. That's what they said when they threw the ropes off the dock to the Titanic as it sailed away. That's what GM thought. Years ago when I was in the business, when I got in the business, 50% of all vehicles owned was a GM car. They were absolutely massive, huge. Too big to fail. Then after he talks about the city in verse 4, he says, then a tower, let's build a tower, a ziggurat to heaven. I put this down, I said, what picture do you have of ancient time people? What picture do you have of Ham, Shem, and Japheth? What do you think they look like? What do they look like to you? I don't know what you've seen, but, you know, I mean, we've seen pictures of the, you know, and I'll make it a little rough, but kind of like, you know, the evolutionists, you know, that, that you start out as an ape and pretty soon you're walking with a suit and a tie and a briefcase. I don't know if you view them in, in that form by no means, but maybe a little prehistoric. I mean, I don't know, did they look like us? They look like us. Look like Aaron? I don't know. They weren't dumb people. They knew they couldn't reach the heavens. But they didn't live as we do. They didn't go to school for 20 years and then work for 30 to 40 and then the last bit try to enjoy yourselves. Shem lived 500 years. Eber lived 400 years. They lived longer, almost twice as much as our country even exists. They weren't in a hurry in school. Can you imagine what you could learn in 500 years? That civilization, that first civilization, wasn't quite as prehistoric as I might envision. I learned that when I went to Israel and saw some of these things in some of these old places and the bathhouses. And the, I mean, these were, these, I could live in those places without running water, and without inside restrooms. They had amphitheaters and libraries and auditoriums. and I mean, they had huge entertainment. That's what drew a lot of the people to the other cults and the other religions. You could go get food, get clothing, get guidance and instruction. It was huge. It wasn't prehistoric. Tower of Babel. This tower was seven levels. 
It was astrological in design. Alistair Begg states it was the first astronomy on top where they would go up top and study the stars. It was later called, as I, I called the Tower of Babel. Babel means El, take the E-L at the end, and if you remember from the beginning, El was Elohim, which was our God in the beginning. And then chapter 2, when we had a recount of the creation, it was Adonai Elohim, he became personal. But this is El, God, stands for God, and Ba was gate, gate to God. The gate tower to heaven. God said, no, you got it wrong. It also means confusion. I'm going to confuse you. Well, at first glance, I thought, well, why is it so wrong what they did? It wasn't, as, it wasn't as if they were fighting against God. We don't have record of that. And it seems to me that the point of it was, it wasn't that they weren't fighting against God. It's that they weren't even thinking of him. They had totally ignored him and pushed him off. And we're only 350 years after the flood and God's out of the picture and Nimrod is against God. He's, he's doing everything, a great hunter. So is it wrong to have goals and to work hard and to achieve and acquire and accomplish things? By no means. It's only when we're celebrating all this without God. When he's not in the picture. When we're ignoring his commands, making towers to ourselves. God has no problem with building when he's in it. He just says, store up the treasures in heaven, not on earth. Have fun, build. He loved to create too. Last week we said, keep building, keep building. Just know what you're building and why you're building. Well, thankfully God doesn't forget us. Verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. The Lord came down. Did God have to come down? No. He knew what was going on. Did God have to come down to the garden? Chapter 3. To talk with Adam and Eve? No. He knew what was going on. But he comes down. Why does he come down? The message is for me is that uh, God will meet us where we're at. He comes down. So then my mind does this once in a while, and I don't know if yours does, but, uh, you know, like, wh where does God hang out? He's in the heavens. What does that mean? How high up is that? I fly, I've flown in a plane, and I get up above the clouds, and the sun's shining, and it's beautiful. I get pictures of, you know, we, we, we've launched, we've went to the moon, we've seen, I can see from the Hubble telescope, you know, all these wonderful things. We've shown you that before, and it's like, well, I don't know, I, you know, I know, like, the sun's like 92 million miles, 94 million miles. I mean, it's a long ways away, but where's God? Is he above that? What's beyond? Where are the heavens? I have no idea where the heavens are, but I presume that it's quite a ways. Somewhere along the line, I looked up, because you can Google about anything, and there was some pretty reliable source that said something of the nature that, well, it's probably approximately 46 billion light years away. Well, that just sounds like a long ways to me. Because I really don't, we have to measure things in light years when we start getting out that far. Because it's too big. We'd have way too many numbers. I thought, well, okay, a light year. Well, what's in a light year? i got to break this down just for fun, so I did. The, the speed of a light year in a vacuum is 186,282 miles per second. So, one, one, thousand. You just went around the earth seven and a half times at the speed of light. Now take a billion. It's a billion of those. So heaven might be a ways. I'm not necessarily saying that's fact. My only point is, I don't think we understand where heaven is and how big it is. But when we start talking about light years, which is what we do, it's like, oh, <laughs> what's the first thing God created? What did Miss Beth say, kids? What's the first thing God created? Anybody remember? What is it? Light. First thing God created, light. You just went seven and a half times around the world. That's our God. 
And he's willing to come and meet us where we're at. He'll come and meet you where you're at. He'll come down and meet you where you're at. Like that. <coughs> Wherever he is. He is patient. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they propose to do will be impossible for them. Very interesting scripture. And I'll tell you, when you do expository preaching, it's difficult, because the text is the outline. You can't take a topical and pull a, pull a scripture out of there and go from there. This is your outline. So I pondered on this one quite a while. And where the Spirit brought me back to, it absolutely brought me back to chapter 8 when after Noah had come out of the ark and he made an offering to the Lord and the Lord said it smelled good and he said, never again. He says, you know what? The intent of man is evil, but never again will I do this and allow this. Never again. And that's exactly what verse 6 said to me in chapter 11. Behold, they are one people. They all have the same language. Behold, I remember the intent of their heart is evil, but never again. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they propose to do will be impossible for them. And I will never again send a flood. So I'll never again let them get to the point of before the flood. Never again. I don't know how wicked that was before the flood, but when you look at it and you study it, it was incredibly wicked. And God said, never again. And I know we live in challenging times, but he said, never again. That's a promise. That's what verse 6 is. So he says, I can fix this. Come, let us go down. Us, let us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to scatter them so they don't understand each other. And I had a lot of fun with this one because I, I, I got me asking myself, they're like, okay, sure. So we can't communicate. You know, we don't speak the same language, Jude. But if we live in the neighborhood, it doesn't mean we move away from each other. That's happened before. We do it all the time, live in the same neighborhoods with people we don't have the same language. Now, it might be a little bit weird. I come out and I see Sam, and Sam's talking, and I think, wow, what? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Barry. Like, I come out, Barry and I, we get, you know, we have fun, we're neighbors, and I come out, and Barry's, like, all of a sudden, he's speaking gibberish. Oh, that's strange, I don't know what's going on. I go back in the house, and I say to Beth, I don't know what's happened to Barry, but something's up. I can't understand a word he's saying. Yesterday I could, today I can't. I think something's wrong with him. Beth says, oh, don't worry about it. I'm having coffee with Jean later. I'll ask her. So she goes over to see Jean to have coffee, and Jean's speaking gibberish. She comes back home and says, something's wrong with Barry and Jean. That wouldn't necessarily cause us to move away from them. We might stay away a little bit, but not move away. So I found this very interesting. What would make people move that far? Josephus, the, which is a historian, biblical historian, one of them, he talked about when they moved, when the people moved, how they sailed. They took boats and they sailed. When God said he was going to scatter, he scattered. What makes people move? And that's what I ask about us. What makes us move? Not only physically, but just emotionally and spiritually. What makes us move? What makes us do anything? I don't know if this case, confusion was probably part of it. Anxiety was probably part of it. Stress was probably part of it. Depression and frustration and disagreements. Like we just can't, find, I don't know what makes people move, but there had to be more. What causes me to move in the physical and in the spiritual? I looked up scatter, to scatter, foots, to break to pieces. It was more than their language, folks. They had broken relationships. It was big. 
to break to pieces. God broke to pieces their plans by causing pain in their lives. So when pain comes in your life, I was talking to Beth about this, don't view it as always bad. God has allowed it. What is that song we sang? God's been good to me all my life. Can you really sing that? All? <laughs> all? Nothing you'd change? Really? It's a good reminder to me that either by God's commission or omission, if I'm his child, I'm in his plan. Pick your side. We're going to see this unfold as we move further along in the script. When change is needed, God sometimes changes our circumstances. It wasn't about the city. It wasn't about the tower. It was about the intentions of the heart. So a man thinketh in his heart, so are we. Life is not about what we leave that people can see. It's about what we built that people can feel. Lay up treasures in heaven. When we don't take the time to communicate well, people scatter. <laughs> the place to save this fallen nation is at home, the kitchen table. So the Lord scattered them abroad from over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. They stopped. Therefore, its name was called Babel, Babel, whatever, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Babel becomes Babylon, idiom for Satan's capital, all that is evil. Daniel 5 speaks of it as a major city of power. Isaiah 13 speaks of it, of the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, how they lifted it up, how big it was. <coughs> Excuse me. But he also says that it's going to be overthrown like Sodom and Gomorrah. Jeremiah 50 talks about how he prophesies against Babylon, that it's going to fall, and how it will be judged for all that it sins. Now, if we believe in it as literal prophecy or spiritual prophecy, it doesn't matter, but don't be surprised if there's a rise and fall of Babylon. I wanted to interject here about prophecy, because we often think prophecy is to tell about the future, and that's not always true. Often, prophecy is told so that we're not surprised as Christians when the events happen. It's like we get it. It fits. That's why knowing the scripture is so important. It's not to tell us the future. We don't take history and try to plug it in the Bible. Take the Bible and recognize it when the event happens. Oh, that's just exactly what God said. <laughs> and then give him glory. See, yeah, we knew that was coming. So how'd you know? Because he told me. It's modern day Babylon. Babylon still exists. Saddam Hussein no longer up there to the top left. That's his castle. Can't read it down here where they've been excavating with the arrow. That's the old site of where they thought the Tower of Babylon was. Modern day Babylon. Still existing. The rest of chapter 11, 10 through 28. There's a zoom out again. We just went through the first nine verses this morning in a zoom in to chapter 10 that talked about and told us when the people had dispersed. Now it's going to zoom back out again and it's going to lead us to Father Abraham. The story of the whole Bible is how God blesses us how he gives us much. 
and how we forget God and turn to our own selfish desires and how God intervenes and brings our hearts back to Him. Today, pick your side. The book of Genesis is about growing up. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. It's no coincidence that this 4,500-year-old city that God was giving us a picture of what will happen in end times, that this great city of 35,000 people then surrounded by a 35-foot wall that was thick will be in the final chapters of bringing us back to the garden that this anti-God movement we're living in will end at the fall of Babylon the Great, spiritually or literally, Revelation 18, 21. And our Lord and King will bring into full view His kingdom, Revelation 19, 22. And today, in the very beginning of the Scripture, we've hardly started, 11 chapters, He's told you of what has not yet been seen. He's let you in on it. He says, this world's controlled by the evil one. The intent of your heart is evil. Don't love this world. True for yourselves today, whom you will serve, Joshua says. God is sorting. He is sorting. Luke, Dr. Luke talks about it. It says, Jesus is winnowing, his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. And he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus is dividing. Need to know that today. He's dividing. He also says, Jesus says in Luke 12, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. And for us that try to keep one foot at the cross and one foot in the world, the day is here when that will not work anymore. Evil is going to force a position. Pick your side. Jesus is our suffering servant, accepting us as we are. When our inability to reach God is realized, he comes down and meets you right where you're at. We've talked about gates. There's going to be another gate, and there's going to be another kingdom that we're going to get to joy the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen.